lot of what we're trying to do is help folks kind of understand, like, why do I necessarily work with a financial advisor and what are some right. of the things? And so we start with this entrepreneur concept of advisors help custom design. Like, like that's one of the things we do as planners. We work with entrepreneurs to help them design benefit packages in some cases and optimize mm -hmm. them for their business. Right. Okay. That, that's a big piece. Um, some other stuff that I kind of wanted us to chat about too, and you just mentioned it. What is it that a financial advisor can do or bring to the table? And what are some of those circumstances where it's like, maybe at this juncture, I should seek out some help? Mm -hmm. Because when you hear financial advisor, that doesn't well, mean a whole lot, yeah, right? Yeah. Inherently. Maybe before we jump down that path, I'm going to Shanghai it for a second and, and um, ask you a couple questions. There's a lot of folks out there that refer to themselves as financial consultant, financial advisor. Mm -hmm. What what do you think goes into this? Like, there's this spectrum. What? Who yeah. are the people that are calling themselves financial advisors? Well, and what I do you need to know? I think that's one of the problems in the industry right now, right? Like, a lot of people might kind of claim that they're a financial advisor, but you don't really know what service set that they're offering. Maybe someone just manages assets. So they sit there and they say, oh, you want to invest? All right, we can do that. Mm -hmm. uh, hand some money over and I'm going to just do stuff with mm -hmm. it. And you're like, okay, well, maybe maybe that person wants more, right? Like maybe they have an estate. So they have a house and retirement accounts and a pension and social security. And they've got a lot of different pieces going on. And they're like, I need to know how all of these work with each other and how how do I manage this whole thing, not just manage this money. So let me sum this up for you in a word. Sure. Scope. Yeah. Okay. No, not the mouthwash. I mean, scope, like what is the spectrum of services that an advisor is offering? Because right. I think you just correctly identified uh, in there sort of a question to the, that people should ask is, what does my financial advisor do? And what am I looking for them to do? Exactly. It's a really loaded question, right? It really because is. Because I heard an advertisement on the radio the other day, and you know, the, it was a bank talking about how they're a fiduciary. And if you want them to actually take authority over your assets when you pass, they can step in and actually like become the trustee for sure. your trust, sure. which that's a whole different scope of, you know, right. of management. And so there's so many different avenues that a financial advisor or a fiduciary can take, which is just a fancy way of saying uh, an advisor who is legally obligated to work in the best interest of the client, which I think that's important, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Because not everyone carries that standard. They can do things that are in the best interest of them. I As will. A, I'll be careful with that one, right? Right, and just because I do want to defend the profession at large here, right? Yeah, fiduciary is a legal standard, okay? Mm -hmm. And so when you're working with fiduciaries, there's a legal obligation to put the client's best interest first, right? right. Now, when you talk about uh, financial advisors that maybe don't have a legal obligation to be a fiduciary, many still act as if they are. Oh, absolutely. Right? And right. so they are still attempting to operate in the best interest of their customer. The, the question is whether or not they have the legal obligation to, because there is a difference in terms of the standard of care associated, right? right. Do you have uh, a, a fiduciary obligation or do you have a suitability obligation? That's right. actually, they sound similar, but they're not the same thing. Can you thing. talk about that a little bit? Well, suitability means that it's acceptable for the client, right? Um, right. The example, that this is always an extreme, right? But let's say that you had two scenarios that were otherwise identical, but one pays a commission to uh, a financial professional, the other one does not. And the long-term difference is that the commissionable product has higher internal fees. You would expect over time that those higher internal fees would erode the customer's performance experience. And so when given the ability to sell a lower fee structure or the higher fee structure, both would be suitable for the customer and that neither is going to harm them. One would be considered more suitable from a fiduciary perspective, but they're not obligated to select the more suitable. They're obligated to select the suitable one, which can mean that there are times that there could be financial incentives that would otherwise 
eh, perhaps cloud the judgment of the financial professional. Mm. I think it's important that you talk about this, though, right? Oh, you, you should, right? And and I'm also really quick to defend. Just because somebody operates under a suitability standard doesn't mean they are not choosing what they believe right. genuinely to be in the best interest of their client. I think that the lion's share of practitioners are trying to serve their clients well. I just don't think all of them are. That's the problem with any industry, right? Mm -hmm. Is that it, it only takes a handful of bad actors to tarnish the reputation of an entire well, industry. And that's why the regulations these days are so tight and so sure, stringent. Sure. So, uh, yeah, I think these are questions that people should ask. So what is my financial advisor? What is the scope of the engagement? What can I expect? I, I'm really convinced that the industry is not pinned down what expectations are. Right. It's really ambiguous. Mm -hmm. There's sort of a minimum expectation that we have to give them statements. Right. Right. You know, there's certain reporting that has to happen. But in, in terms of how businesses operate, there's a tremendous amount of difference from business to business so, in terms of how they engage with their customers. I'm going to interview you for a second. So oh you said that there's a lot of variation in this field. What are, you know, you set this company up and you've designed it to be and feel a certain way. Yeah. What really, maybe not separates, but what are some things that you kind of think are unique to Little John Financial that might be Maybe I know this is going to sound like you're bragging on air for a second, but kind of sets you apart where you feel like you might differentiate yourself from a more generic company that is just going to manage the finances. Sure. Well, maybe to answer that, and you know, I get bashful about this stuff, right? We've been doing this radio show for a long time, and we try not to turn it into a sales pitch, right? My, my yeah. take on this has always been that good education for our listeners is exactly that, and if the needs of our customer aligns with what we offer, mm -hmm. then it's a good fit. But I just wanna help teach people to do this because I'm convinced you can do this yourself. It's just a lot of people don't, won't, can't, there's lots of reasons for it. So then you need somebody that you can trust. So with that as the backdrop, right? Then why was this firm created, right? First was because uh, having operated in some other firms, I found that there were a lot of internal rules that were designed to protect the business more so than the customer. Okay. And I just felt like that was a little bit misaligned. Uh, second, I find that a lot of other firms are designed to accumulate lots of representatives of the firm, but all of those representatives, they do some common things in their business, but then a lot of things are not common, right? So everybody's kind of running their own business within a business. And so you don't get the consistency of result when, by going from player to player. Some practitioners are really good and some are less so. Yeah. Right? And so I think what, what I was shooting for with, with our firm, with, with Little John Financial, was uh, a more consistent experience for the customer. And the biggie for me was I didn't want internal competition for customers. Mm -hmm. Okay, I felt like that was a disservice to the client was to create a your client, my client env environment where people were competing for the same customer. So it, we built a team practice. Right. Right. And I think that was a huge differentiator in philosophy that says, well, who, whenever a customer calls, they are who we exist to serve. Right. So that was just the the first and foremost is, well, let's know who our customer is. Let's know what rings the register for us. Next, it was let's make sure that we as closely as we can align our incentives so that we win because our customer wins. Right. right. As opposed to we win regardless of whether or not our customer wins. That didn't seem like the right alignment. So that's why we are primarily when it comes to our asset management, we're a fee only firm. Can't say we're fee only because we have an insurance branch as well that can offer insurance to customers. Uh, we don't do it a whole lot, but it's available. And because that's a regulated product, there's a commission structure to it. Mm -hmm. We can't really strip that out in many cases. So uh, we can't say that we're fee only because if we do insurance and you do a handful of contracts a year, then you know, it, it means that we're in conflict with that. So we are fee based, but our asset management, when we say fee only, think of it this way, right? We charge a percentage of the total account that we're managing for our customer. Okay. Okay. 
And rather than having a transactional expense associated, so whenever we buy or sell something, we get a commission for it. It doesn't, we don't get it in any kind of compensation for buying and selling. And a lot of, would you say there's still, you know, definitely a handful of firms out there that operate it's, that it's way? It still exists because a lot of mutual funds are still built that way. Right. They're designed to pay some kind of commission structure. And then there's a residual fee that's paid sort of in later months or years. Back to the it, firm it, that... To, yeah. To, yeah, essentially to the, the representative, it's to service accounts, right? So there's a reduced fee on the back end that comes back. It's called a CDSC or a contingent. Well, the contingent deferred sales charge is a, sa a sale penalty if you if you get out early. But they have what they call 12B1 fees. Mm. 12B1 fees are those residual fees that are collected out of the operating expense of the fund and they're paid to the, the And you're saying that's not something that Little John really... We don't, yeah. we don't charge trail fees on anything because we're not buying with commissions, right? We're buying yeah. it wholesale. We do charge a fee for service but that's to stay aligned, right? And here's, let's just kind of use easy math. These are not necessarily real numbers, but let's just use your easy math. Um, let's say a client has uh, uh, half a million dollars that we're managing for them. Okay. And just to keep the math easy, let's say that we charge 1% per year. Okay. Okay. So 1% of a half a million dollars, it's $5,000, mm -hmm. right? If we can grow the account to a million dollars, then we would win with the customer. They have twice as much money. We're getting paid twice as much too now because we have one percent of a million dollars instead of half a million dollars. Mm -hmm. So our interests are aligned. If the account shrinks, we you don't want to stop paying. This is a really hard one, by the way. People think, well, why don't I only pay if they're making me money? Okay, this is this is actually a super important question. I'm looking at the clock. I want all of you guys listening to stick around for the answer to this question, which is. Should I pay my advisor when the markets are going down? Mm. Very important answer to that might surprise you. I'll tell you right after this break. Stick around. I'm Dave Littlejohn. And Matt Dixon. And you got True Wealth. All right, gang. Welcome back to the True Wealth Radio Show. Dave Littlejohn in studio with... Matt Dixon. And I promised we would answer a really interesting question. You should catch the podcast if you're just uh, joining us today. We're talking a little bit about fee structure. We're specifically talking about what makes Little John Financial a little bit different, which mm -hmm. I don't normally talk about because I'm not too into like major promo of our firm. I get it. Yeah, I don't throw the even phone think it's up. a promo. I think it's just informing people, hey, you know, we might be a little bit different than the next guy. And you need mm -hmm. to know that because we might not be the right fit for you. Right. But then again, maybe yeah. it is perfect. And by the way, there are other fee-based or fee-only advisors around. Oh, yeah. Right? So so we're not it, right? Nope. Um, but we have our way of doing things, and, and we like it. But but nevertheless. And if you don't like it, kick rocks now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and find somebody you do like. You know, that's how that goes. <laughs> and kick rocks. Um, all right. Why? My, the question, the loaded, very loaded question is, uh, in a fee-only or a, a fee-based asset management scenario where you're getting a percentage, like I said, the advisor is charging a percentage of the assets they're managing. Mm -hmm. It is often asked to me, why should I as a customer pay the advisor if the account is going down, mm. right? I understand if the account makes money, we both profit because, you know, hey, I made money, so you should make money too. But if I'm losing money, a lot of people say, then shouldn't you be losing money? Right. And and what I would suggest is the advisor is being paid less, so they feel the impact. The business is very aware of this impact. But what could potentially go wrong if you only paid your advisor when you made profits? Well, I'll ask this question. Wouldn't the advisor just want to take on more and more risk? Because if you're not getting paid when you're losing, wouldn't you just want to ratchet up the risk and try and get you know, super high returns. And I don't know, like, want or not, but wouldn't that be the incentive, right? Yeah. Because you're like, well, look, if I guess wrong and you don't make money, okay, I don't make money anyway. But if I guess right and you make some money, I get paid. Right. So you kind of disincentivize risk management. It's like telling a baseball player in the major leagues, you know, 
basically you're only going to get paid if you hit home runs. Well, he's going to swing like crazy every time he steps up to the plate. Yes. And he's going to only he's going to swing at almost everything. Yeah, if it could be a home run ball, may as well. You yeah. know, because if there's no penalty, it's like, look, it'd be different if you're you gonna said swing at every you're going to get paid for home runs. Yeah. But you're not, you know, and you'll get paid for base hits too, right? Like, yeah, it, it's kind of one of those you things. you lose your say, entire paycheck if it's a walk. Well, <laughs> yeah, I, mean? I sort of say like, you don't get paid if you strike out. That would be the better one, right? A walk actually still gets you on base. That's, that's, a, that's playing it smart, right? Mm -hmm. But if you, it, what's the difference? You only get paid to make home runs or you don't get paid if you strike out. There's a difference. One of them is going to be more defensive in nature. They're going to go for high percentage shots. And th that's the thing about investing. It's like a lot of folks, you know, there's different philosophies. It's like, well, look, I'm going to take 20 bets and one of them is going to be a home run and it's going to make up for the 19 losers. We don't prescribe to that theory, just so you guys are aware. Yeah. Right. It is about um, long term diversification value. And there's a lot of risk management strategies associated. And you know why? Easy answer. Like, why should you manage risk? Because sometimes clients need to take money out and you don't want your account to be way down when you need to access that the money. That is so true. Yeah. Right. That's a, sometimes that's... you need the money. And so if you are. Yeah. Risk... Wouldn't you rather take yeah, money it... out when the markets are up? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, for sure. You definitely don't want to wait until like how. Uh, the most recent example, like 2019 going into 2020, March of 2020, markets fall like 30 something percent in weeks, mm -hmm. right? Two, three weeks, everything just collapses. What if you had to move and you had to take a big withdrawal from your investment accounts once th you get 30 percent less purchasing power at that right. moment? Yeah. Okay. Well, and I think I'm glad you brought this up because I actually hear this question all the time. People are like, is it a good time for me to take some money? And I do often say, hey, let's take a look at, you know, where is the account? And oh my goodness, you're up $50,000 this year. Go ahead and take $20,000 right. out. Unless you like have 500 million and be like, well, you're barely making anything, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. So remember, numbers should always have context. That's another one that I would That's tell you true. for any financial advisors out there. It's like, make sure the numbers have context because mm -hmm. there's three kinds of lies in the world, right? There's lies, damn lies, and statistics. <laughs> <laughs> You're not wrong. We were talking about what are some ways that Little John Financial kind of specializes in? What are some of those avenues where it's like, that's kind of an area where they're really comfortable and familiar with. And so... Diet sodas. Unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> I won't drink them. I can't. I can't do it. Um, I love my real sugar Pepsis, as David will know. Um, but no. Okay, getting back on track. So, David, do you want to start us off? Just give me one short little thing where... Because I'm actually... I'm going to throw you on the spot. What's something that you think we do well? Something I think that we do well. Yeah. Uh, I think we're pretty high touch with our customers. Like we don't agree. even have a phone tree. Like if you call, you mm -hmm. either get a person or you get a voicemail that like we all get harassed by and you get called back usually within moments. Right. So, yeah. so you almost always get a live person to answer the phone and we don't do phone tree on purpose. I don't even know that that, that is a good one. That's not really where my brain was at. So oh, okay. More See of that? like some of the areas where it's like when we're doing business, it's like, hey, that's something or that's a person that we tend to help. Right. So like I'm looking at this and saying, Matt. What's the answer you're looking for? Okay, I'll give you one. <laughs> I'm going to give you one and see if you can yeah. keep this He's going. trying to lead the way to something like, well, go ahead. Just, you know, yeah. go for it. Okay, so I think one of the areas where I think we do well, um, you have a spouse that's passed away, right? And yeah. you, didn't, you didn't really know maybe kind of how everything was invested. It just wasn't your area of expertise. I think we do inherently a pretty good job of bringing that person in and saying, hey, you know, we don't want to talk over you. We want to be able to get you kind of up to snuff with what it is that we do, why we do it. And does that make sense for your journey? Yeah. Because sometimes it doesn't. And it's like, hey, this isn't a good fit. But I think we do a good job communicating and coming up with ideas of how to help that person who has gone through a tragedy, needs a plan, needs someone that they feel comfortable with, and kind of walking that person through what the next steps are. Yeah. 
Uh, sadly, I think you're right. And sad only because, um, you know, when folks are going through challenging yeah. times like that, I think a lot of it just comes down to, again, it's pretty personal. And our culture is not big mega business right now. It's no. very um, personable. And so because we try to know all of our customers like by really name, well, yeah, it's yeah. like you're not just a number. Yeah. We know who you are. And and so, yeah. I, I mean, it's interesting, too, because we not everybody qualifies to be a client. No. Right. And and that's not because we're trying to be uh, uppity about things. It's because the people that we've made commitments to, our first, our first obligation is to them. So before mm-hmm. we take on new obligations, we have to make sure we can meet the existing obligations. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, we're, we spend a great deal of time. I think there's a, a compassionate side to us, but there's also a lot of education. So people will come in and they don't have a good knowledge base. And so we, we try to build that knowledge base up so mm-hmm. they can be confident in what we're doing. And then we work together on it. I mean, speaking about the education piece, mm-hmm. the other area I think, you know, we kind of dive into a little bit is for the person who has maybe multiple income sources and is getting close to retirement. Um, and they're trying to look at all the different pieces of the puzzle and say, how do they all fit together? And they need someone that can analyze what are all the different pieces that I've got going on in my life? And then what is the plan moving forward? Can I retire right now? Um, where should I start accessing money from in retirement? A lot of people don't know. They have maybe right. five or six different areas where they could access money, but they don't know what the most tax efficient way to access money is is and so they they show up and they say hey walk me through this yeah i would say that is it goes into strategic planning okay now these are terms that get tossed around a lot but strategic plans like you need a strategy to be efficient and so the idea is well let's look at all the moving parts that you're working with and then let's figure out an optimized way to deal with them right yeah Uh, and that's just highly personal you can't kind of give that advice on the radio because everybody's circumstance is unique Mm -hmm. and their needs are unique but our, our the idea would be that you sync up by understanding what they're working with and what their goals are and then developing a strategy to optimize what they're trying to do. So, yeah. I, I, and, and, you know, it, it generically falls under the term planning, right? But, but planning is pretty nondescript. And so mm-hmm. that, that's my frustration. Our industry, because of regulation, waters a lot of terms down. And, you know, what are we really trying to do for our customers? Look, you worked really hard. To, to, to scratch together what you have over a lifetime, let's not screw this up, right? right? So let's not unnecessarily give it to the government. Let's not um, like mischaracterize the way we manage our taxes and overpay where we don't need to. I think I just said the same thing twice. Um, let's not, um, uh, I guess, be frivolous or uh, and, and accidentally make an unforced error that costs us, right? right? That's that's one of the things that we see a lot. And so there's just a lot of things that, that come down to efficiency and in the plan B stuff, mm-hmm. right? You know, hey, we, we got to make sure that we got, if it's not going to me, who, where's it go? And how do right. we, how do we do that stuff the right way? So I, I just think that there's, there's so much, I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's funny, but the money management, that is secondary to the planning for us. Mm-hmm. It's the thing that, wags the dog at the end of the day but if you if you have a lousy plan you know you blow up you know a whole lot of money in a hurry so you got to start with the good fundamentals i think that's just where we're at okay well there was so much more on the list david but i don't know that we've got time for it no we got like 18 seconds or something okay let's just leave it at this um how do folks reach us if they have a need it's super easy to go to littlejohnfinancial.com so littlejohnfs.com and uh, chat us, give us a call. We're easy to find. Yeah, it's true, all the best. So give us a chat when you can. And um, also, you know, consults are free. So we're, if, if we can help or we can get your point in the right direction, that's what we want to do. But we're out of time for now. So until next time, I'm Dave Littlejohn. And Matt Dixon. You've been listening to True Wealth on News Radio 93.9 FM at 1240 KQEN.